Scripture reading comes from Matthew 5, verse 8, as we continue in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. So how's your heart this morning? Blessed. <laughs> Pretty good. I heard some things. How many of you have uh, to do morning blood pressures? The doctor requires you to do your morning blood pressure. How was it this morning? Mine was a little stressed when we have to got to church here. I was running a little late as I packed the car to go on stay, leave after church. And a couple things in the technology section weren't completely done. And usually we have plenty of time to do them before service. So my blood pressure might be a little high right now. By the way, it's always high when I'm getting ready to proclaim the word of the Lord. If I checked, if I checked my Fitbit, I'd probably see my heart is racing. It's all good. It's all good. I'm sure that some of you know your cholesterol number is pretty good, right? You know your HDL and your LDL, and you know your triglycerides. I know mine. My triglycerides are always high. The doctor always looks at me and shakes his finger. We know the physical numbers about our heart, don't we? I know I became acutely aware of how important they were when Sue had her first heart attack. The, the blood pressure became a daily routine every morning. And then quarterly, we had to go through all the battery of other tests. So I got familiar with those numbers. The doctor would always encourage her to take care of your heart, do some exercise, you know. Do what your heart can sustain, but do it small in increments because every little bit helps. And so they encourage us, right, to eat right, lose weight, keep our heart healthy. Because the heart is crucial to living, right, without the physical heart beating, life ceases to exist. By the way, your heart has everything to do with your spiritual well-being as well. Jesus continues to add to the growing list of ingredients that help us look like and be followers of Jesus Christ. Right? He's adding another ingredient today. He's explained that we need to hunger and thirst after righteousness, right? That we need to what? Be merciful to others, to be compassionate to others. And then on top of that, he goes to another ingredient which cuts to the heart, literally, of the issue. Blessed are the poor, poor, pure, not poor, pure, in heart, for they shall see God. I'm sure the hearers in that afternoon, by the way, were suddenly uncomfortable as Jesus said those words. I imagine that many of them turned and looked away. They didn't want to make eye contact with them anymore. They looked at the ground. They kind of started counting the clouds in the sky. Some were looking at the grass and counting blades of grass. They checked to see if their shoelaces were all, if their sandals were all taken care of and because they didn't want to make eye contact with the one who was truly pure of heart. By the way, I'm sure there's a few of us today because we know our hearts. We're a little uncomfortable with the topic. And down that hill that day, it was a tension-filled moment. The stress was everywhere. You see, it's equally stressful for us because if you're like me, you know your heart, right? See, I know the anger that I've harbored in my heart at times for people. I know how my heart quickly goes to, that idiot just cut me off in traffic and practically created an accident. I no longer verbalize it. Sue, Sue got me out of the habit of voicing it and yelling at him. But my heart's still there. If I only had red lights or police lights, I would light them up. That's where my mind and heart go. I know my heart. I know my heart. We know our hearts because we know when we've done wrong things. We know our hearts and how we react when someone has, in our perception, infringed upon my rights or my space. Becca used to call it her bubble. When people would move inside her bubble that she didn't like or got too comfortable with her and she didn't know them, and she knew what her heart's reaction was to that. The heart is crucial to physical life and spiritual life. It's equally true for the people who aren't followers of Jesus Christ they just don't know it. But if you and I are a follower of Jesus Christ, our heart issue has to be dealt with. The 
heart is the center of all of our activities. It's the source from which everything flows. Our will, our thoughts, our anger, our hatred, our lust, our joys, our mutterings, our celebrations, our dreams, our hopes, all of our life flows from the heart. The heart is crucial. You see, that's when David sinned with Bathsheba. We remember the story, right, in 2 Samuel? What does he say? God, against you have I sinned, and and against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. But what does he ask God to do for him? He asks him to wash him and clean him, and then he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. He knew that his heart needed to be changed. It needed to be remade and remanufactured. He realized that God had to do something on the interior because what? You delight in truth in the inward being. You see, God desires truth in the inward being. God is looking at our heart. He's not looking at the externals. He's looking deep within us. Because Jeremiah laid out the problem for us. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And God bases it on what the heart says and how the heart is. See, God understood the the heart of men and women is where sin most impacted creation. It's where sin marred us and scarred us and drags us down. Sin in our heart leads us far away from God. It's sin in our hearts that fuels our pride and says we don't need anybody else. We can handle this on our own. And we ignore the Creator. By the way, God's people had drifted far away from God. They were in a foreign land. They were suffering immensely. They were in slavery, and if they weren't in slavery and had some freedom, they were doing menial tasks. They were looked down upon as the underclass of society. They certainly weren't part of the privileged. And there they were in that foreign land, relegated to non-glamorous jobs, a non-glamorous lifestyle, far away from anything familiar, far away from the land they loved. And God says to them, I promise when I redeem you, when I save you, I will do a work on your heart. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you, I love this line, a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone From your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes so you be careful to obey my rule. God understands it's a heart issue. Throughout the Bible, he identifies it as being an internal issue, a heart issue. The gospel of Jesus Christ is concerned about your heart. The condition of a person's heart is vitally important to that relationship with God. And by the way, it's vitally important to the relationship with each other. And Jesus understood how important the heart is to living and thriving in life and achieving God's best and receiving his best. God created you to thrive, but sin wants to hold you back. So it's a heart issue. By the way, have you noticed that human beings don't like heart surgery? (laughs) Human beings don't like heart surgery. Physical heart surgery? Scary. When they tell you they're going to crack you open and do a bypass, or they're going to crack you open and do an LVAT or a transplant, these are scary. Even the thought of running a little catheter up your femoral artery to go into your heart to put stints in is a major procedure because you could be dead if a clot breaks free. Nobody likes heart surgery, right? And by the way, nobody likes it when Jesus wants to do heart surgery on you either. We like where we are. And so we know we have to protect our heart and we have to do things. So you know what we do as human beings? We start inventing rules to protect our heart. Because we figure if we wall our heart in, then sin really can't get to us, right? 
That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were first focusing on the external. They were setting up a series of rules and regulations that if people did, God would look at them and say, they're okay, because look at what they've done. He never dealt with the heart. See, that was Saul's problem. Remember, Saul had the instructions from Samuel the prophet. When you get to this city, you destroy everything. This is the word of the Lord. And when Saul and his army got there, he saw some of the beauty of the health of the animals and stuff. And he decided he would save the best and he would save some of his other stuff. And when Samuel got there, he says, what is this bellowing I hear? And Saul says, well, we saved some of the better animals. We're going to offer him a sacrifice and worship to God. And Samuel says, what does he say? Because this is a heart issue. He says, don't you know obedience is better than sacrifice? Following the word of the Lord is the best thing we can do for our life. And that takes a heart aligned with God. It's an internal issue, not an external issue. That was the problem, too, with Jesse's boys. Samuel came to anoint the next king, and, and Jesse, proud dad that he was, brought all his sons out, right? They were men, man. They looked like they were warriors. And Samuel's looking at him. God says, no, 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 I don't care. He's six foot. He got six-pack abs. No, no, he looks, okay, he's 6'3 and 225, and he can run a 40 and 4'4". Four, four. No, we don't want him either. He says, so Samuel says, is there another son? He says, well, yeah, I have this little scrawny little kid. He's out handling the sheep right now. He's just a little boy. He's about 11, 12. Well, bring him on in. And as soon as Samuel said him, God said, that's my boy. That's the next king of Israel. And the text says that man judges on outward appearance, but God judges the heart. God judges the heart. You see, we are no different than the Pharisees and the people of the Old Testament. We look at exteriors. So by the way, we in churches have created lots of rules to protect the exterior. I've never figured out how in high school, when I was in high school, wearing your skirt just above your knee for a lady was really going to create a lot of sin in your life. Because it didn't matter whether it was all the way down to the ground or whether you wore really, 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 really short shorts. Men are still visual and they're going to sin. Never quite could figure that out. It's like when the guy told me, if you want to come to our school, you need to cut your hair because the length of your hair really isn't appropriate for a real true believer in Christ. And I'm looking, believe it or not, with all this balding, my hair was about here just below my ears on my shoulder. And my foster mom's rule, Ruth's rule was, as long as it's neat and clean, you can wear it as long as you want. But it always has to be neat and it always has to be clean. Because you know what we were doing? We're judging the external, not the internal. We, we create all these rules. This is the only translation of the Bible you should read. How long do you spend in prayer every day? How many books of the Bible have you read? And how many verses do you read daily? Do you attend church every week? We create rules. What songs do you sing? What music does your church play? <gasps> is it that really... 7-Eleven songs. You know what I mean. Is it those drums beating in the background? It's amazing or not, but drums are one of the ancient, inst ancient instruments of all time. But yet we have churches that say, if you're playing drums in church, that's devil's music. Again, we create all these barriers to externals. How you do communion, how we do baptism. How often we create rules. And by the way, just so you know, our culture is doing that too. So here's the latest thing that's happening in our culture. And by the way, this is very important. You need to be listening well. Because the philosophical roots about the theory I'm just going to talk about in a second here has penetrated so deep in our culture, it dictates what TV shows are saying on TV and what you're seeing in the characters being played out and how they interact with people it's impacting how the news delivers it and what it says. 
And if you don't have the right verbiage, you're wrong. And if you don't have the right attitude, you're wrong. And this is going deep into our culture. It's called critical race theory. Critical race theory. And I'm just going to give you the simplified version. Simply put, critical race theory says racism is systemic. It's systemic. It's everywhere. And if you're really woke, that is if you really believe in social justice, you have to fight racism. So here are the list of rules that you have to follow to fight racism. Here is the language you must use and the behaviors you must exhibit. So they're creating all these externals that we must follow. And by the way, it has been adopted by many in the culture. They're fighting it in the schools. It's in universities. It's getting into government and how government treats people. And by the way, it is espoused by many with religious fervor. Do you know I think some proponents of critical race theory are more willing to go to the mat and, and argue with you and fight for you to believe in critical race theory than some Christians are in telling others about a creator who loves them and his name is Jesus Christ and he can change their life. I hate to say it, but I think they have more passion and more fervor at times. But I want you to notice something. What did I just say? They were establishing a bunch of external rules to be the guidelines of how not to be racist. But I want you to understand something. Racism will not be solved in this country by forcing obedience to a set of rules or ideology on anyone. Because we, until we address the hard issue, racism will continue. Because you can give me those rules, and I can change my language a little bit, and I can look like I am no longer racist, but in my heart, I am still racist. That's the problem. That's why Martin Luther King Jr. said what? The dream that he had of a future was we judge a person by the content of their character and not the pigmentation of their skin or the color of their skin. Racism is never going to be dealt with in America until, or in the world, until we deal with the heart issue. That our hearts are full of sin and we need a heart surgeon to go in there and start cleaning house. We need to God, God work on us. You see, until Jesus does that heart work, we'll never be able to understand what racism doesn't look like. Because until Jesus does a work in your heart, we truly don't understand how to look at someone despite their ethnicity or despite wherever they've come from or what they look like as image bearers of God. But that's what God says they are no matter what the pigmentation of our skin or no matter where we grew up in the world and our nationality or ethnicity is, you and I are image bearers of God. The Bible says we are created emio Dei, in the image of God. And until we change our hearts, we can't change the behavior. Until God convicts us of the sin of racism, it will remain unchecked. It will operate unabatedly. But Jesus wants to attack your heart. And by the way, this isn't just about racism. This is about any sin in your life. Whether it's your, your pension to lie or to lust or to, see, to deceive people and cheat on your taxes at times or whatever it is. God wants to change your heart. That's why Jesus says one of the ingredients to really being a follower of mine is blessed is the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the poor in heart. You see, life-changing faith is not about doing. Let me say that again for you, because we get this wrong too often. Life-changing faith, that transformational faith that Jesus wants to bring into your life as a follower of Jesus Christ is not about doing, but rather it's about who we are at the core of our being. 
who we are deep within us. Are we poor in spirit? Are we mourning over our sins? Do we live a life that's under self-control and that's meek? Do we hunger and thirst to be God's person, to live the way God wants us to live, to experience his best in our life? Are we totally committed to Jesus and be more like Jesus and allowing the Holy Spirit to conform us to the image of Jesus? Are we being merciful? Do we extend God's love and mercy to others through actions, not just nod to God? You see, it's a heart issue. It's really a heart issue. Jesus stressed on the interior is vital for us to understand. For his, most, his first and greatest charge against the Pharisees was what? That they were religious people far away from God because they were more interested in the externals than they were the internals. They were more interested on the outside and whether you washed your hands or if your pots and pans were cleaned. Matter of fact, Jesus actually says, hey, you, you turkeys, you think you know me, but you don't because you're worried about the external and I'm in the internal business. He noticed how good they all looked. You know, we have a couple stories in the Gospels where, where the Pharisee, he, Jesus said, would love to stand in front of everybody and let everybody know how pious he was and the way he prayed and the, the garbs that he wore. And he made sure his tassels and his hair were just right and his prayer shawl tassels were hanging out so everybody could see, I'm a man of prayer because I'm wearing my prayer shawl. And they wanted people to see what they looked like. By the way, we have a lot of people who look good on Sunday morning. Oh, we love to dress up for church. I heard a black preacher once say, you know, if you can dress up for the man, you can dress up for God. But the problem is sometimes the externals look wonderful. And we see them carrying their Bible and we see them in church. And they know how to stand and sit during worship. They know exactly what's going on. They seem to know the music and it appears they love to sing. And they're looking good. But in their heart, they're still full of sin. Wickedness still reigns. They still struggle with issues. That's why Jesus says to the Pharisees, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you have ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. You know what they had forgotten? What had they forgotten? Do you know what the heart of the Old Testament law was? Do you remember what Jesus said the heart was? Love God, and what else? And love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. Where's their heart focus? It was on the external. Where's our heart focus? Do we at times strain out the gnat instead of coming alongside someone who needs us? You see, the minute you start wanting to really share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have to understand this. You're going to encounter people whose lives are messy and they're in filth and mire and muck. And Jesus is saying, are you willing to get down in that and roll up your sleeves and get yourself dirty so that you can be in relationship with them, so you can speak to them and listen to them and direct them to me? See, too often the way every, everything I heard and been trained in, we look for the sociological principle that drives church evangelism and church growth. So we look for people who look a little bit like us, who fit our ethnicity, fit our lifestyle segment, who fit what we look like because we're comfortable with that. But meantime, there's a community around us of messy, broken people who are desperate for something new in their life, who desperately need something to change their life. And the reality is, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the answer. 
you have the solution to their life. And the question is, are you going to, willing to get dirty? Are you willing to get down with the pigs in the mud to rescue them? That's what it comes down to. Stop, we need to stop worrying about the exterior and worry about the interior. We have to worry about their heart. The heart is the problem. All our troubles flow from the heart. That's why Jesus said to those same Pharisees, do, not, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and then is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. From out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile the person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. But see, our culture doesn't believe this. Our culture believes that changing a person's environment, changing them by giving them a set of rules to follow, will solve the problem. You see, all of man's problem is environment. So we have to work at changing our environment. We have to work at giving them a better education. But let me just tell you something as someone who loves history. Time does not allow me to give you the list of all the wonderful people who have graduated from places like the University of Washington, Washington State University, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, University of Paris. All these elite institutions. The list does not the time does not allow me to give you the list of all the people who have attended those and had the best education in the world who have broken their promises and lied and cheated and stolen or committed crimes. History is full of them. Better education doesn't solve the problem. So we put kids in foster care too. We take them out of a home and we say we're going to put them in foster care. But you know the statistics show that doesn't make a difference in their life for the most part? Why? Because those who love the environmental change premise fail to see the one tragic flaw in their premise. They skip over it and they ignore it because it's rooted in theology. So you ready? Adam, the first human being, lived in a perfect environment. He had perfect fellowship with his creator, God. God created him the perfect helpmate. Beautiful, as you can imagine, as perfect in every way to meet every one of his needs. And they had this harmonious, perfect relationship. They were absent the marital difficulties that we face because of sin. Everything was provided for them. It was the perfect life. But Adam and Eve willfully rebelled against God's word and God's law and sinned. Lloyd-Jones put it this way, it was in a perfect environment that man first went wrong. So putting man in a perfect environment cannot solve his problems. Because our problems come from our heart. Man's problems are the real result of sin at the core of our being. So to develop a new environment, to develop new intellectual skills is not going to solve the problem. We have to go deeper. We have to get to the heart of the issue. The problem is my heart. The problem is your heart. We need to address that. Jesus does, because he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Pure is an interesting word. At its root, it means uh, there's an absence of uh, defilement. There's free of defilement. It's not contaminated. It's often used in the context of being pure. It's not mixed with anything. that doesn't have any other alloys with it. So to be pure in heart is to be utterly sincere the whole life, John Stott says, their public and private is transparent before God and men. Their very heart, including their thoughts and motives, is pure, unmixed with anything devious, ulterior, or base. Hypocrisy and deceit are important to them. They are without guile. And that's exactly what happened. You see it in the Gospel of John. 
one of the disciples had met Jesus, and he runs off, and he gets Nathan, and he says, you got to come meet the Messiah. He, he's come from Nazareth. And, and what does Nathan say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth, that podunk little town? It would be like saying, can anything really good come out of Ronald, Clay, Ellen, or Roslyn? South Clay, Ellen. And when Jesus meets him, what does he say? There is an Israelite who has no guile in him. You see, I always tried to live my life. I made the pledge, and I don't know if I succeeded at times, but I made the pledge that my kids would, would have a public perception of me that was the same as their private perception of me. That I live my life in such a way that I wouldn't have this one character for work as a minister and this other characteristics for being their parent, and it was different. I tried to make sure that I lived in the same. The psalmist put it this way, he who has a clean hands and a pure heart is one who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. A pure heart is one that's undivided. It's without defilement. It's without contamination because we are not willing to lose our souls for falsehood or lose our soul because of deceit our hungering and thirsting after righteousness and the mourning of our sins helps keep our focus on our relationship with God and that helps to give us stability. Because if we truly mourn our sin, we don't want to talk to God about, about sin. And we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. We want to look more and more like Jesus and we're trying to live the right way. So we're centering our life on following him. It's our desire to what? To walk with him. To be with him. And that means we must diligently strive to have a pure heart, to be free from impurities. Now, goldsmiths, silversmiths, they did the same process. You know what they do? They get the, they get the things that have the gold in it, the stones, and they get all the alloys together, but they're impure. So they put them in a pot or a kettle, and they turn up some heat underneath it. And as the impurities separate because of the heat, they skim them off. And before it spoils and gets burned and is no longer usable, there is a moment in time that they know that they're at the point of purity when they can kind of look into the kettle and see a reflection of themselves. The fire helps purify them. By the way, fire has another really good advantage, and we see this with steel a lot. Fire purifies, right? But fire also strengthens the steel. It makes it stronger. What I want you to know is that the purification of your heart starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. When Jesus enters into your life, because you've humbled yourself before God, you were poor in spirit and mourned your sin, the fire of the Holy Spirit starts to move in. You've asked God for forgiveness. You've surrendered your allegiance to Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit is all of a sudden starting to clean house. J.I. Packer put it this way, new birth in God recreates our disordered, egocentric, anti-God, anti-moral hearts in such a way that Jesus becomes our dis disposition. His disposition becomes ours. His character becomes ours. He goes on to say that our normal habits change and we start forming habits of loving and serving God and caring for our neighbors. You see, once you surrendered your allegiance to Jesus, the Holy Spirit has moved in and he starts the process of reordering us and remaking us and he starts by cleansing us which means he puts a little fire to our life. The Bible talks about the refiner's fire. We sang about it this morning, right? Refiner's fire. Yeah. God loves to put a little heat in your life. Why do you think James says, consider it all joy when you face trials and tribulations? Why, he concludes, 
because it's building your character. Character reflects your heart. So God wants to purify your heart. So he's more worried, not about the externals of your life, but about the internal heart of your life and your character that exhibits that heart. So he's going to put a little heat in your life. And the heat has a way of sanctifying you. That's the word we like to use in theology. It just means to set you apart, to help you look more and more like Jesus. And by the way, that fire also starts to strengthen you like it strengthens steel so that when trials and tribulations come your way, you are standing firm in the midst of everything because God can walk with you. And God is there. And by the way, just so you know, this process will continue until you see Jesus face to face again. Until Jesus returns, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, that refiner's fire is going to constantly go on in your life. You know, I'm 63. I wish I, wish I had it all together. But this grief counselor nailed me on a couple things and said, okay, i got a couple more areas I have to work on now. And I thought about it and said, so God, why didn't you take care of this years ago? And it made Sue and my life so much better. He doesn't answer me. He just keeps bringing it up that I need to work on it now because the Holy Spirit is working on me. And that refining process is continuing. And here's the cool thing. Even when we fall, even when we fail, even when we continue to make mistakes, even when we continue to sin in a moment, the Holy Spirit never gives up on us. He never quits. He never abandons us. Matter of fact, we need to hear the words of the Apostle Paul when he says, but thanks be to God, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When we're in Christ's love, we still fail. We still make mistakes. We're still sinful people, but it's no longer the habit of our life. We're trying to improve. We're trying to be set apart. We're trying to look more and more like Jesus. And so there's no condemnation. What happens is the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us, gives us a little boot in the rear end. Sometimes he takes a a four by four over my head, but that's okay, and gets my attention and starts correcting the behavior. Because the only way you and I can have a pure, undivided heart is to allow the Holy Spirit to enter our hearts and begin the cleansing process. Only the Holy Spirit indwelling us and working within us can purify the heart, literally give us hearts of flesh by replacing our heart of stone. See, I just picture Jesus as being the greatest cardiac thoracic surgeon because he doesn't even have to cut you open to take the heart out and change it. He does it. God is continually dealing with us in our hearts. And I don't know about you, but I long for that day when I see him face to face, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant, and I see him. Because that's Jesus' promise, right? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. But until that day, every day, my prayer is, Holy Spirit, be my breath, be my life, and I submit, submit my day to you care for me, continue to make me more like Jesus, teach me how to do everything I do for the Father's glory, keep my, pure, my heart pure today. And really, that's the commitment that he's speaking to us today. And he's asking, will you make it? Maybe you've never accepted Christ in your life. And he's saying, we can start the transformation process because I love you and I'm willing to forgive you if you just believe in me. And there's some of us who have been working with God for a while and we still have areas of our life that we don't like the heart surgeon to work on and we try to ignore his advice. I'm just going to ask you, will you just give it up? Will you surrender that area of your life to him so that he can purify your heart? And continue the work of making you look more and more like his son, Jesus. So that the world will see God in you. And what a little taste of the goodness that God is giving you in your life.
Because when you, when you ultimately surrender your total allegiance to Jesus and you allow the Holy Spirit to start cleansing your life, you start experiencing the very best that God has for you. So church, stop settling for second best and third best and fourth best. Stop being content. Allow God to lead you to a better place. The promised land of his presence. Allow him to cleanse your heart. Father God, move in us right now. Speak to us. Shape our hearts. Meet us here in these moments. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do as you speak to all of us. In the name of Christ.